I'll open us in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for a Sunday morning, uh, a reminder of an empty tomb, a reminder of sins paid, a reminder of that payment accepted, and the resurrection proving your son's validity, your son's sufficiency to actually pay for sins, to declare righteous the ungodly. We thank you for an empty tomb that means the end of death for all those who believe in your son. And we thank you for the promise of life that begins at new birth and continues right through our mortality here into eternal life with you forever and ever and ever. We thank you for the opportunity this morning to look again at the doctrine of salvation. And we pray that it would refresh our souls, that it would reinvigorate our current living that it would energize our evangelism, that it would inform our hearts uh, at your great love. We thank you for this day and ask that you'd help us as we look into your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're continuing our study of the doctrine of salvation, that big fancy word soteriology, and this is part four of five for now. There is more material than we could cover in this five-part series. There is more material on the doctrine of salvation, more meditative opportunity thinking about what God did for us in Christ than we could exhaust in a lifetime. When you think about eternity and you get a glimpse of the throne room of heaven from Revelation 4 and 5 and you see the concentric circles of worshipers around Christ and He is forever the Lamb slain. There is a reality that in eternity future, all heaven will never forget what it meant for Christ to become the sin bearer for us. So part four this morning, we're looking particularly at the sovereignty of God in the salvation of sinners, the sovereignty of God in the salvation of sinners. And by sovereignty, that's another good college word. It just means God's in charge. He's in control. He exercises his plan according to his purposes. And when we think about the sovereignty of God and salvation, it's probably helpful for us to zoom out just a little bit and think about God's sovereignty in general. What does it mean for God to be sovereign? In essence, we simply mean the godness of God. God is God. He transcends the created order. There is an infinite distinction between the creatures and the creator. There is the one who was not made, and then there is everything else. And the one who made everything is the one upon whom all the made things are dependent all the time, meticulously. And so when we think about the sovereignty of God and his overarching sovereignty over all things and his meticulous sovereignty down to the fine details of history... We are talking about the fact that God is God. He is the uncreated creator of all things. Everything belongs to him by right of creation, and nothing can happen apart from his sovereign hand. Now, let's think about Daniel 4 and 35 as we consider just the general sovereignty of God, his absolute sovereignty over all things. From the lips of Nebuchadnezzar. God's dominion is an everlasting dominion, Daniel 4.34, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth, and no one can ward off his hand. No one can say to him, what have you done? Isaiah gives a similar statement in Isaiah 46, 9 to 11. Remember, says God, in Isaiah 46, beginning in verse 9, remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, Declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country, truly I have spoken, 
Truly, I will bring it to pass. I have planned it. Surely, I will do. This is God's overarching and meticulous sovereignty over all things. He controls the fates of kings and of kingdoms, and he controls everything under them. But what about salvation? When it comes to the salvation of sinners and you think about your own testimony of God's grace in your life, is God meticulously sovereign there? And you might think, well, wait a second, I, you know, I, I chose to follow Jesus. You, you may have sung the song, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. And biblically, that is absolutely true. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, at one point in time, you did decide to follow Jesus. A discussion of the sovereignty of God and salvation does not take away human responsibility in salvation, nor the emotions involved in salvation, nor the volition, that is the will, involved in salvation. And yet back of every human activity that can happen in salvation is the sovereign activity of a God who loves sinners and purposes to save them. Again, when we think about the word salvation, we simply mean a rescue. You were in trouble and someone rescued you. It implies inability, hopelessness, helplessness, spiritual death. Someone from outside of the sinner must rescue the sinner. Who does that? Only God. The fundamental doctrine of salvation is simply stated this way. God saves sinners. That's the biblical doctrine of salvation. God saves sinners sinners. And we don't save ourselves. We couldn't save ourselves. We can't bring ourselves into a condition of savability. We don't initiate. This is all of God. Truly, God will get the glory for all that he does in the work of salvation. Even when he operates through the will of man, the emotions of man, the desires of man, God is back of all of it. That is simply what we mean in the, in the discussion of the sovereignty of God and salvation. And there are plenty of passages that will enjoin humans to believe, to repent, to cast themselves upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the Bible is full of admonitions and pleas and commands to believe the gospel. And yet, no one would believe had God not purposed to save. Had God not purposed to bring salvation to sinners. So while it's helpful to think about all the passages that deal with man's volition, it is also helpful to think about all the passages that deal with God's sovereignty and salvation. And just from the starting point, we recognize that God's sovereignty and human responsibility are not enemies to be reconciled in the Bible. They are very much on good terms in the scriptures. We get in trouble because we like to pit them against one another. Uh, but the Bible will do no such thing. Let's just take a trip this morning a little bit and listen to God's word speak of God's sovereignty in the doctrine of salvation. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. And we read in verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Ephesians 1 9, God made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. This is language straight out of Isaiah 46 that we just read. According to God's own purpose, according to his intention. Ephesians 1 11, we have become an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, 
so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And what is the reason for all of this? So that no one may boast. You see, God is getting glory for himself in the salvation of sinners, not only in the fact of the salvation of sinners, but even in the way in which he accomplishes it. As Paul concludes the, the explanation of the gospel in Romans from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. There is a no boasting clause in the soteriology of the Bible. Sinners are not to be rescued and then say, look what I did, look how I got here. And some have described this this way, and this would be my own experience. I came through the door of salvation in Jesus Christ simply believing that I was a sinner and I needed a Savior, and Jesus was the only one. And, and from my perspective, I had chosen to follow Jesus. I had decided for Jesus, and I walked through the, the door of salvation thinking my will is what accomplished this. And as others have described it well, you walk through that door and you look back over to your shoulder and you realize, oh, God did this. God brought me through this door. And again, as we said last week, God doesn't bring sinners through the door of salvation apart from their will. He takes that which is spiritually dead and unable and makes it spiritually alive and willing. The doctrine of salvation goes right through the human will, not around it. Listen to Acts 13, 48. When the Gentiles heard, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. How many Gentiles believed? All those that had been appointed to eternal life. By the way, all of these references are in the notes. You can pull them up on the website from the Equipping Hour page, uh, or you can get them afterwards. John 6, 37, Jesus said, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Why do people come? Because God gives those being saved to the Son. Why are they drawn? Because the Father draws them. Jesus said in John 17, 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. John 6, 65, for this reason I've said to you, no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. In Acts 16, we come across a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira. She was a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God. She was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Why did Lydia, an Old Testament-style God-fearer, respond to the gospel when heard by, from the Apostle Paul because God opened her heart to do so. Jesus said in John 10, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Understand from Jesus' discussion in John 10 that the doctrine of the sovereignty of God as applied to salvation is not simply a negation of the high and haughty so-called free will of man, uh, an indifferent ability to choose one thing over another which uh, we Americans just love to worship. It is not just a, a chopping out of the, the ability of man at the knees, but the doctrine of the sovereignty of God and salvation positively is such a comforting doctrine. Do you understand that if God saves and brings you to himself and says, there is no one greater than me and no one can snatch you out of my hands, then what brought you into salvation will never let you go out of salvation. We can't say that about the will of man. We can't say that about the natural abilities of man. We can't say that about the fickle desires of man. But the sovereignty of God, who has in love saved sinners, 
is a rock-solid foundation for comfort and confidence and joy and assurance in our salvation. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. For by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. How did I get here? It was God's doing. Titus 3, 5, he saved us. Hebrews 12, 2, Jesus is the author and the perfecter of faith. John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, a new covenant text all the way back at the giving of the Mosaic covenant, God promises, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. And in Deuteronomy 30 and Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 and 37, all those new covenant promises that God made to Israel, it is very clear who takes the initiative who overcomes human inability? Who brings life out of that which was dead? Who secures sinners for salvation at the heart level? It is God who does that from beginning to end. I won't read to you all of Romans chapter 9, but I would refer you to it. Philippians 1.29, to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Anyone who is a Christian, it must be said of them, God has granted it to you to believe. God has graced it to you, given it to you freely of his own will, according to his kindness for his purposes. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? This is true for anything anybody has in the Christian life. It is absolutely true of salvation. We cannot boast of it as if we didn't receive it. That is salvation, all of it, from repentance and faith through spiritual gifts all the way through assurance and eternal life. All of it is a gift of God received. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, God has not destined us for wrath, but God has destined us for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. What do we see in Scripture? God is the one responsible for saving sinners. God saves sinners is the doctrine of salvation in the Bible. It, God initiates. God does the work. And if God were not meticulously sovereign over the things that humans do, the choices that humans make, if God were not sovereign over the recreating out of nothing something that is spiritually alive, all of us would be spiritually dead. Uh, do you understand the alternative? If we get depravity right, if we understand human inability right, if we understand the Bible's doctrine of sin, that will lead us appropriately to the Bible's doctrine of salvation. No one could save us from sin's complications but God. Who can overrule them? Who can overrule me? <laughs> Praise be to him for that. Well, let's talk a little bit about the sovereignty of God in salvation through means. The sovereignty of God in salvation through means. We understand that God uses means to accomplish his sovereign purposes. Uh, this really is the narrative of Scripture. The sovereign God of the universe, the one in charge of all things, uses creatures, finite beings, circumstances to accomplish His sovereign purposes. I want to think together for a little bit about divine sovereignty and human responsibility just in general, and then we'll think about it in terms of the doctrine of salvation. You remember Proverbs 16, 9, that a man plans his steps, but what? Yahweh directs his paths. A man plans his steps. I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. I am going to put my foot down. And what is happening as I am putting my foot down and, and my other foot and my other foot? God is directing a path. We would call this compatibilism. Compatibilism. 
That is, human actions and divine sovereignty, again, are not enemies. They're not at odds with each other. It's not a tug of war and who's going to win. Sometimes I win and sometimes God wins. Uh, No, they are compatible. God in His sovereignty orchestrates everything that comes to pass through the instrumentality of human beings, of moral agents with wills, with desires, who carry out those wills and desires via activities. These things are not at odds. They are compatible in Scripture. I want to give you just a couple of examples. Turn to the book of Jonah. Jonah's tiny. It's hard to find. It's on page 936 in my Bible. That probably only helps Ben James and Janet and whoever else has this one. Some of you out there have this one. Page 936. You know the story of Jonah. In Jonah 1.15, after much conversation, after much terror, after much pleading from Jonah, the sailors on the ship pick up Jonah, throw him into the sea, and the sea stops its raging. Who threw Jonah into the sea? The sailors on the ship. They threw him into the sea. Fast forward to chapter 2 and verse 3. Just a few verses later, Jonah, in his prayer, says, You, God, threw me in the ocean, cast me into the deep. Who threw Jonah into the sea? God did. Who threw Jonah into the sea? The the sailors did. Now, did the sailors feel like automatons, robots, uh, captive to do something contrary to their will, contrary to their abilities, contrary to their notions? No, they weren't thinking about God, except terrified that he had brought the storm. And who's responsible for this? (laughs) But they physically picked up Jonah and threw him over the gunwales. Gunwale, do you have gunwales when you don't have guns? I don't know. They threw him over the side. God threw Jonah in. Turn to Genesis chapter 20. And it's great for us to get these glimpses behind the scenes of what is happening from a cosmic perspective, from a heavenly perspective. And and we have these windows into this throughout Scripture, but these are not one-offs. These are actual explanations of what happens all the time. But we get the curtain pulled back in several places to see this. Genesis chapter 20, Abram journeyed from there toward the land of the Negev. And he settled between Kadesh and Shur. Then he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she's my sister. So Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. By the way, that's just being a bad husband. Technically sort of true, she was his sister. Um, But why was he saying that? He was afraid because she was beautiful and somebody's just going to take her. In order to take her, they're going to have to kill me if they assume that I'm her husband. So I'll just play the sister card. They won't kill me, but he can have my wife. Uh, (laughs) uh, Not a good plan. Uh, But God came to Abimelech, verse 3, in a dream of the night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you've taken, for she is married. And Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a nation even though blameless? Did he not himself say to me, she's my sister, and she herself said, he's my brother? In the integrity of my heart and in the innocence of my hands, I have done this. In other words, I've I've taken her and still not touched her. So Abimelech's taking responsibility for his integrity. And then God said to him in verse 6, yes, I know in the integrity of your heart you have done this, and... I also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. What's going on there? God is sovereign behind the scenes, ensuring that Abimelech does not touch Sarah. Abimelech didn't know that until God told him 
Abimelech was just doing what he wanted to do. And God behind it, back of it, is meticulously sovereign over his desires, over his will, over his activities. These things are not enemies in the scripture. They are compatible. They go hand in hand in the narratives. In fact, every narrative of scripture is essentially that story. Men will do what they are going to do. They will be held culpable. By the way, Abimelech was going to be a dead man. He's being charged by God here. Uh, And yet God is accomplishing his purposes. Turn to Isaiah chapter 10. We're going to skip Isaiah chapter 10. You can read it later. Same story, different players. Let's talk about election and evangelism. Election and evangelism. If God is sovereign in salvation, you may have said, I have said, you may have heard it said, you may have heard it. Why do evangelism if God is sovereign? I mean, if God's going to save whom he's going to save, then why do I need to tell anybody? And it is exactly this point we are making this morning. God saves sovereignly through means. God uses means. God uses the means of human instruments to accomplish his purposes in lots of things. And when it comes to the doctrine of salvation, God uses evangelism to actually bring people to himself. God does the drawing. We saw that last week. No one can come unless the Father draws him. And yet God commands us to proclaim the gospel. Again, these things are not enemies. Evangelism and the sovereignty of God. In fact, I would commend to you J.I. Packer's book by that title. If it's a difficulty in your mind that, that these two realities hold hands and work together in gospel progress, you need to read J.I. Packer's book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. What is the relationship between God's sovereign, unconditional election and our evangelism? Henry Martin says this. Uh, this comes from William Carey's uh, biography um, or a, uh, his grandson's biography of William Carey, S. Pierce Carey wrote. And William Carey quotes Henry Martin from a letter dated December 6th, 1806. And he says this. Through the support and power of God... I think I am willing to continue throwing in the net at the Lord's command through all the long night of life, though the end may be that I have caught nothing. What is he saying there? He's going to do evangelism in a hard place with potentially no results. I turned off my mic so I could sneeze, and I think the act of turning off the microphone stopped the sneeze, so that's good. William Carey was recognizing, and Henry Martin recognized, that being obedient to the Lord's command to cast the net over and over and over again could be done with endurance because God was sovereign, because we could trust his purposes and his timing and his plan. We should never be so arrogant to think that heaven depends on my abilities, my winsomeness, the quality of my fishing net, or any technique, but solely on the sovereign work of God. That gives evangelists great comfort to go and go and go and go and trust the Lord with his timing. It ought not cause us to give up. We recognize, as Packer has said, that evangelism is man's work, but the giving of faith is God's work. What are some reasons to evangelize biblically? First of all, just obedience. If Jesus says, cast your net over there, we're going to cast our net over there. If Jesus says, take the gospel to every living creature, we want to take the gospel to every living creature. If we are commanded by the Lord to broadcast the good news, take the seed of the gospel and cast it broadly. Our task is not to determine the quality of soils. Our task is not to create quality soil but to broadcast seed. How do you determine who the elect are, who will respond to the gospel positively and endure to the end? 
by preaching the gospel to everything that moves? Have you ever wished for the election blacklight? You know, I don't know if you've searched for scorpions in your backyard. Um, I haven't done that in my backyard yet. I kind of don't want to know. I've done that in other people's backyards. <laughs> but you shine the black light and the scorpion just glows. Wouldn't it be great if there was like a, uh, an E on an arm and you could just shine the black light on there? Oh, the elect. Okay, I'm going to preach the gospel to this person because then evangelism's really fun. <laughs> now, there's no such thing. How do you find the elect? Preach the gospel to everybody. And you see who responds because God raises the dead. There's a second reason to evangelize beyond obedience. It is simply straight worship. To stand in front of any creature and to say, Jesus is a marvelous Savior. Let me tell you about my Savior. Let me tell you what He has done for me. I, I want to boast in the forgiver of sins. I want to proclaim from every mountaintop the one who bore sins on Calvary's cross so that sinners could go free. And if nobody ever listened, Jesus heard it. God heard it. The, the heavenly audience hears and sees and rejoices we just worship. Evangelism is the overflow of worship in the presence of an unbeliever. I think it's one of the great ways to share the gospel it is not just some sort of formulaic, programmatic, four-point outline, but tell somebody what Jesus has done for you. Make sure the four points are in there or however you articulate the, the substance of the gospel. But wed the truth of what the gospel is objectively with your story subjectively. Tell people what Christ has done for you. This fantastic evangelism. And it's just worship. And therefore, every evangelistic endeavor is by nature successful. Why? Because you have said, from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be the glory forever. Amen. You have worshiped. You have praised God. Look, Jesus said this himself in the triumphal entry when the little children were crying out Hosanna and the religious hypocrites said, tell them to be quiet. Well, if they're quiet, the rocks are going to cry out. There's something about the created order that will one day just not resist at all praising God. And right now, the natural world does that. Psalm 19.1, all creation screams out the glory of God. Who resists? Demons and us. And one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So to confess Jesus as Lord now just reflects what we'll be doing for all of eternity. And to do it in the presence of an unbeliever who never believes still honors God. So evangelism, we do it simply because it is worship. Successful evangelism, every time we open our mouths, glorifying Christ. There is a third reason to do evangelism, and it is the recognition that evangelism is the means God uses to actually save sinners. It's why you're in this room. We do evangelism because it actually works, and you're the proof. We do evangelism because not only are we obeying the Lord, not only are we worshiping the Lord, but this is the means by which God has set forth to actually bring other sinners to himself. Somebody shared the gospel with you. Somebody wrote out the gospel for you. Somebody translated the scriptures into your language. And you believed. Let's talk for a moment about foreordination and prayer. What is the relationship between God's sovereignty and prayer? You may have heard it said, you may yourself have said, why pray if God's sovereign? Why pray if God's sovereign? Have you ever thought about that? If, if God has foreordained all that shall come to pass, why should I pray? I mean, does prayer change things? Does, does God need to listen? If I'm praying in time and God has foreordained before time that something should happen, what in the world does my prayer have to do with anything? Have you thought those thoughts? I want to flip the argument on its head Think about it the other way for just a moment. If God were not sovereign, why pray? 
Have you ever thought about that? If God had not power to overrule circumstance, if God had not meticulous sovereignty to channel the king's heart in his hand, if God did not have the power or the desire to actually cause events that involve human will, human desires, human volition, then why pray? What are you praying for? And I think this conversation happens most in the realm of evangelism, where we as humans, particularly as American humans, we have the Liberty Bell and the Declaration of Independence, and we love our freedom, and we, you know, live free or die. Um, When it comes down to, is human freedom going to be usurped by some monster? And, and then the defenses come out, and the, the thing I have to protect above all things is, is libertarian free will. Some sort of, uh, I believe, imagined ability in a human to indifferently pick one thing or another. Right? We won't get into the whole discussion about what is libertarian free will. I will just say that it doesn't exist. And you can read Jonathan Edwards on that, or Martin Luther on that, or your Bible on human inability. Um, But that the idea that I am indifferent to choices, as if I'm not driven by my internal inclinations, uh, there's no such thing. We're, we're, We're always choosing what we want at some level. And the problem with humanity is we want sin unless God turns on the lights and transforms the heart. But the argument about uh, prayer and evangelism uh, comes down so often in the conversation that, that God would not dare usurp human free will to bring somebody kicking and screaming into the kingdom of God. And so how do you pray for an unbeliever if you uphold that view? Um, God, save my friend. Change Change their inclinations away from sin and toward you. Oh, no, you can't do that. That's off off limits. That's the human will. Um, God, would you change his heart? Oh, no, he can't do that either. Um, God, will you, I know, will you arrange the circumstances around my friend so that it provides the perfect Petri dish of opportunity where my friend is self-inclined to choose for you. Now, in order to arrange that Petri dish, you have to overrule all the wills and inclinations and desires of every human being in their circle of influence to accomplish it. But Lord, will you do that? (laughs) I mean, you just run into a significant problem with prayer if God is not powerful nor, nor willing to actually do things. I'll quote J.I. Packer on this point. You pray for the conversion of others. In what terms now do you intercede for them? Do you limit yourself to asking that God will bring them to a point where they can save themselves independently of Him? I do not think you do. I think that what you do is to pray in categorical terms that God will quite simply and decisively save them that he will open the eyes of their understanding, soften their hard hearts, renew their natures, move their wills to receive the Savior. You ask God to work in them everything necessary for their salvation. You would not dream of making it a point in your prayer that you are not asking God to actually bring them to faith because you recognize that's something he cannot do. Nothing of the sort. When you pray for unconverted people, you do so on the assumption that it is in God's power to bring them to faith. You entreat him to do the very thing. Your confidence in asking rests upon the certainty that he is able to do what you ask. Before I had the theological categories of human free will and God's sovereignty, before I knew to talk like that, I prayed like a Calvinist. That's a label, sometimes an unhelpful, unfortunate label. But I prayed like I believe God was meticulously sovereign even over the doctrine of salvation. I wanted people to be saved. I I knew that only God could save me. My only hope for other salvation was God and God alone. I want you to turn to Exodus 32. There's a remarkable scene where we we get tripped up. And, and, And I don't know that we get untripped but we see what happens with prayer and God's sovereignty and God's eternal plan. Right, if God foreordained 
everything that should come to pass, why pray? I, I want you to see an example of this in Genesis 32. Look at verse 11. That's not what I'm looking for. What am I looking for? Let's try Exodus 32. Wrong book. Why are the people that are supposed to be in Exodus not in this chapter? All right, Exodus 32, 11. Moses entreated Yahweh, his God, and said, O oh Yahweh, why does your anger burn against your people? whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians speak, saying with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and all this land of which I have spoken, I will give to your seed and they shall inherit it forever. So Yahweh changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. This is a remarkable passage. And it brings us up against some, some conundra. Does God ever change his mind? This text says that God changed his mind. I think it's important for us to think carefully about what God changed his mind from and to. And there's a principle here related to threat of punishment and relinquishment of punishment in God's eternal purposes. We just see it spelled out in detail in the context of Moses' prayer here in this verse. Of course, Exodus 32 is the scene of the golden calf. Uh, the, the rebellion of God's people against him when they melted down their jewelry and bowed down to this calf. And God says to Moses on the mountain, verse nine, I have seen this people. Behold, they are an obstinate people. Now let me alone that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. Now put yourself on the mountain Think about being in Moses' sandals. And God says to you, you know all the difficulty you've been having with these people? I've been having that same difficulty. Got a new deal for you. Um, you get to be the head of the nation. Forget Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Forget all the other tribes. It is now Moses. We're gonna rename the country Moses. The Mosesites. What's the problem with that plan if enacted? God made promises. God made promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Jacob gets renamed Israel. Jacob, Israel has sons that become the tribes. One of those tribes is Judah and the scepter will not depart from him. Judah becomes the tribe from which Messiah would spring. Moses isn't of that tribe. Think about what happens if Judah is cut off and a new nation from, Mo from Moses. You get the Mosesites and no forgiveness of sins, no Messiah. Is that God's plan from the foundation of the world to have a nation called the Mosesites? No, it's not. God is threatening judgment and punishment here in verse 10. And what is Moses' response? I don't know what your response would be. Hey, country named after me. That sounds like a good deal. I'm tired of dealing with these people anyway. And Moses, according to Scripture, was the humblest guy there was. And what does Moses do in his humility before God and in his intercession for the people? 
He prays. Verse 11, he entreated Yahweh his God and he said, Oh, Yahweh, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should your name be slandered among the Egyptians? And then he says in verse 13, covenant promises, eternal purposes. Remember, Moses says, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses' prayer is an appeal to God's purpose. What is God changing his mind from? Threatened punishment. What is God changing his mind to? His plan which he's never left. God has never left his plan. God has never abandoned his promise to bring about a Messiah through Judah. He's never abandoned his plan to bring his seed into a land and establish them as his people before a watching world. He has still not abandoned that plan, even if we think historically it may have been cut off. God will keep his promises. And so when Moses prays for the people or when Gentile Christians today pray for the peace of Israel, we are praying that God will accomplish what he said he would do. Even when all hope looks lost and God's people are under judgment and punishment is being threatened. And Moses prays, And God changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. God did not change his mind about his character, his purposes, his plan. (laughs) No, in fact, that's the very thing he's upholding. And how is God upholding his purpose and his plan here? By means. What means? Intercessory prayer from the lips of Moses. Does prayer change things? Yeah, from what they could have been to what God planned for them to be in his goodness and kindness and undeserved favor towards sinners. So why do we pray? Well, like evangelism, we're supposed to, and it's worship, and it is means. Prayer is a means that God in his sovereignty uses to accomplish his good purposes. Let's think about predestination and missions for a moment. We have the Great Commission in Matthew 28, the Assembly of Heaven in Revelation chapter 5. How do we get from Matthew 28, the Great Commission, go take the gospel to all the nations, teaching them to observe, and people surrounding the throne of the Savior from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. How do we get there? through means. And we've talked about this before, Romans 10, 13 to 17. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they're sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who's believed our report. So faith comes from hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. How do people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people surround the throne of the Lamb? By faith. Where do they get faith? By hearing about Christ. How do they hear about Christ? Preachers proclaim. How do they proclaim? They go. How did they go? They got sent. And beautiful to the feet of those who go and proclaim. God uses means to bring about his predestined ends of procuring for himself a people from every tongue and tribe. Why do we do missions? Well, because it is guaranteed successful. There's nothing else you can be involved in that has more guarantee of success than being a part of God's body, God's church, which he said he would build and the gates of hell would not prevail against it, going out in concentric circles to every tongue and tribe and nation and people. Nothing better you could be a part of than the church in expansion. It works. It works. Why? Because God has chosen to use it as means to accomplish his eternal purposes. Now, if you talk along these lines, if you use words like predestination, election, foreordination, these are biblical terms, they're in your Bible but you will be accused, uh, maybe called names. Uh, You may have been called a Calvinist. Um, 
we like John Calvin. We don't believe everything he said. But he articulated biblical truth. And oftentimes when people get called a Calvinist, if, if um, in, in religious circles, in theological circles, in Christian circles, we think about the doctrine of salvation, that God's in charge of salvation. You go outside of our little... Um, theological bubbles, and the world thinks about Calvin a little bit differently. Um, part of the Enlightenment, the, uh, a profound humanist um, who uh, was part of the, the move to, to bring back reading and literature and the classics to Western civilization. He's seen as an economist, um, and, and, and the world sort of looks at Calvin a little bit differently. But in theological terms, if, if you're called a Calvinist, um, sometimes it's a pejorative. Um, we don't tie the doctrine of soteriology to Calvin because he didn't invent it. And in fact, we, we might say that Paul was a Calvinist or Jesus was a Calvinist. Rightly, we should say uh, Calvin was an Augustinian and Augustine was a Paulinist and Paul was a Jesusist. <laughs> Jesus said, no one comes to the Father unless the Father draws. And we think about Paul and the doctrine of salvation, and he said, I do all things for the sake of the elect so that they may obtain salvation and with it eternal life. To be a Calvinist or to be a Paulinist to, to believe in everything Jesus says about how salvation comes about is not to sit on our theological haunches and do nothing. It is to evangelize profusely, pray intercessorily, and it is to do missions relentlessly. That is the biblical model. We plead, we invite, we command Listen to an entry from William Carey's diary. William Carey is the one who said, I wouldn't do missions if God were not sovereign. And yet he didn't sit around waiting for God to do something apart from him. Thursday, June 12, 1806 from Calcutta. Here's his diary entry. 5.45 to 7 a.m. Dressed, read a chapter of the Hebrew Bible, devotions. 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. Family worship in Bengali with servants read Persian with Munshi, his language teacher, revised a scripture proof in Hindustani, then breakfast, translated a portion of the Ramayana from Sanskrit into English with the help of Sanskrit pundit, 10 a.m. to 1.30, government college classes, 1.30 to 2, dinner, 2 to 6 p.m., revised a proof of Jeremiah chapter in Bengali, translated most of Matthew 8 into Sanskrit with Mritanyanjay's help, 6 to 7 p.m. T, read Telugu with a pundit. A son of the Reverend Timothy Thomas of London visited. 7 p.m. to 9 p.m., prepared and preached an English sermon. About 40 present, including Judge Harrington, who afterwards responded to my plea and gave 63 pounds, 10 shillings towards our Calcutta Chapel building fund. 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., translated Ezekiel 11 into Bengali. Have cast aside my first edition translation... <laughs> Letter to Ryland, read a Greek Testament chapter, commended self to God, end of day. And then he said, I have never more time in a day than this. What does it mean to believe that God is sovereign? Oh, sit around, twiddle your Calvinistic thumbs and wait for people to get saved. Not so. William Carey's son, William, also served as a missionary. Carey wrote to his son the following, the conversion of one soul is worth the labor of a life. Hold on, therefore, be steady in your work and leave the result with God. Be encouraged, my dear son. Devote yourself wholly to your work, for this is the cause God has had in his mind from eternity and for which Christ shed his blood and for which the Spirit and the Word were given. So its triumph is certain." Are there means other than our preaching the gospel by which people can be saved? I want to think, to think about that very carefully. And by preaching the gospel, that can be verbally, in print, Bible translation. But proclaimers, 
Can people get saved and believe the gospel, for instance, by looking at the stars, by being burdened in their own conscience, by reaching out to some mysterious light? The Bible's very clear. You have to hear the word of Christ. But I would point to you one possible exception to that. Turn to Revelation 14, 6. Revelation 14, 6. Now, Revelation 14 is right smack dab in the middle of the great tribulation. And verse 6 says this, I saw another angel flying in midheaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those earth dwellers and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God, give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. Who is proclaiming coming judgment and the command to worship God? An angel flying in midheaven, in the skies. Consider the context of this perhaps one exception. Its place in history and its implications. Um, a text like this doesn't get us off the hook for preaching the gospel in our day. In fact, I think this verse is an indictment against the church age. This text happens during the Great Tribulation. And there are people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people who will hear a warning of judgment from an angel flying. Who should every tongue and tribe and nation and people have heard from in our day, by our time? Us. You think about Acts 1-8, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Consider the 1600s, the age of exploration, when European navies are traipsing all over the globe, fighting over boxes of pepper, and the gospel didn't go to the Finister Mountains in Papua New Guinea. Think about the tragedy of human technology that made it convenient to get everywhere on the globe. And the church was lost, mired in the medieval ages and the corruption of medieval Catholicism. They, the church had lost the gospel, buried the gospel, buried the Bible, killed generation after generation of people trying to put the Bible in people's languages. The church failed. And praise God that Jesus, the Lord of his church, would not let it fail forever. But there's a reality that an angel is preaching judgment and the imperative to worship the Lord during the tribulation, flying in mid-heaven, <laughs> seems to be an indication that the task has not been done. This is our task. God uses means to accomplish his purposes. God is absolutely, meticulously sovereign over everything that transpires, and he is sovereign over salvation. And God uses means. Preaching the gospel. Praying. Let's go to him now. Lord, you are the Lord of the harvest. We pray that you would send out laborers. We pray that you would send out the kind of people confident in your sovereign work and salvation, for that is our fuel for endurance, to never give up, that you have your people, and you will call them to yourself by faithful, relentless preaching of the gospel. May we be those people. May we do it because you've told us to. May we do it because it is worship of you to proclaim you in front of anyone. And may we do these things because you have seen fit to use our feeble voices, our imperfect gospel presentations, our timidity, and our boldness to bring people to eternal salvation. Would you do it for your own glory and may the Lamb receive the reward of his suffering. It's in his name we pray, amen.